What's up fellow citizens of the world, Jordan Patrick here and welcome to my channel. As I've mentioned in previous videos before, I had a very traumatic experience that happened to me on January 1st, 2017. That's when I fell off a bridge in Madrid and had a near death experience. And so today I thought I would tell you and explain what happened to me and how I've grown as a person and am a better human being since then. So, on y va, c'est parti. So I thought I would break this down into different chapters because I feel like a totally different person today than I was four years ago. And so the first chapter is called Reckless. Now before 2016, 15, 14 and all throughout like my younger years, I was very reckless and would do really stupid, careless things and because of that, I had a lot of accidents. And I'm talking about just accidents that have happened to me since moving to Paris. The first one took place in 2015 when I went to the Techno Parade in Paris. I was with a couple friends and okay, we were drinking, partying on the streets. It's a really fun time. I really enjoy this parade. But then it gets towards the end at Bastille and like a lot of us thought it was a great idea to climb this fence. And there are spikes at the top of this fence. So I'm following some friends, they've already hopped over, so I'm climbing up the fence and I slipped and fall on one of the spikes. And in the back of my leg, I have a scar um, because I was punctured by one of these spikes, uh, <laughs> no joke. And I ended up spending the evening in the hospital because I had to get stitches. And I felt bad for my friends because I cut their parade short. I mean, this is just like the very first accident that I had in Paris, not the last. And then about one year later, um, I went out with some friends for some drinks and then I took the Vélib to go home. I was rushing back to my place and as I'm riding the bike, tipsy, um, there was a scooter that was parked kind of halfway in the street, halfway on the curb. And as I'm going pretty fast, I don't really see like how far it's sticking out. And with the bike, I hit the back of the scooter and just fall. And I end up breaking the, uh, the first four teeth. Um, so these are veneers now. This is not my natural smile. I had nice teeth before the accident, but then after the accident, it was, it was awful. I have some pictures, which I'm definitely going to show. Did not like my smile. I was super embarrassed about it. For a while, it's like I would only smile like this. I would not smile with my teeth because I was ashamed. And when I went home, I had an appointment with the dentist to, to fix my teeth, get veneers. So yeah, these two stories are just leading into then what ended up being the biggest accident that I had ever in my life. And I feel so sorry to my parents because they had to deal with this unsureness of whether or not their child was going to survive or not. So that brings us to chapter two, which is January 1st, 2017. So this trip, I was in Madrid. It was just like all my other trips in Madrid, nothing special until this point. I was visiting some friends, going out, having a good time. And then on New Year's Eve, I go to a friend's place. We're drinking as we do. We have the grapes at midnight, which is an awesome, it's one of my favorite traditions in Spain is that at midnight you have 12 grapes. They represent all the 12 months and you get 12 wishes. A normal New Year's Eve night, drinks with friends, and then we were going out. It was maybe 2 a.m. And we're going, we're waiting in line, and then finally we get into this club. And I remember everything up until this point. I remember going inside, but I had a jacket that I could just easily tie around my waist. And I told my friends like, oh no, I don't want to wait in line, like you guys wait in line, but I'm just gonna go inside with my jacket around my waist. That's the last I remember. We probably drank on the way, so that's just adding to already being drunk. You know, it's my fault, like I shouldn't have been so drunk. And this is the reckless part of, you know, my growing up is that when living in Paris and going to these parties, like, I was not shy to drink, I was not shy to every once in a while take some drugs, 
and or smoke or you know like I was not in a good place and I was not healthy I was not really being responsible and looking out for my own safety so this night what happened exactly what led me to the bridge I'm not sure I don't know I was alone and what I do know is that the bridge was right outside the club that I was at so I could have easily walked there. Someone had either seen me fall or they saw that I was on the ground and they told the bouncer like, oh, someone fell, please call the ambulance or whatever. And then next thing I know, five days later, I'm waking up in the hospital to my mom above me in bed. And they had put me in an induced coma for my body to recover because I had broken many things. I broke my hip, my wrist, a few ribs, and the biggest injury was actually in my brain. I had some brain damage and excessive blood clots like in my brain. And so I have to this day, like I have this major scar that runs all the way around to here. And I was really self-conscious about it a few years ago um, because the scar was just so prevalent and especially when I had short hair, it was so obvious. And now like as my hair grows a bit longer, my first videos on my channel and you probably wouldn't have noticed it, um, but now that my hair is shorter, you can, you can see it. I had to have surgery for them to pump out the blood and during this five day period, I was in an induced coma was not waking up. I had a catheter, which is probably the most uncomfortable part of this whole thing. There was also like a language barrier between my parents, myself, and the doctors and the, the nurses. Like, the doctors spoke okay English, um, but the nurses, none at all. So we couldn't really communicate with them to, to see where the process is or what's happening. My parents were also very nervous about the whole medical situation in Spain. I think it's pretty common to be really like unsure of how good the medical system is in a foreign land. I understand their reasoning, but looking back, it's like the medical team and staff and attention that I had in Spain was miles above and beyond what kind of attention I got in the US. Kudos to Spain and Madrid. I'm going to give a nice shout out to this facility in, in Madrid because they really took great care of me. And six months after my accident, when I was fully recovered, I went back to visit and give them a handwritten letter from my mom, thanking them for their service and help with some pictures of the before and after. And I can't thank them enough for the the attention and the help that they gave me, I'm forever grateful and I'm here because of you. So thank you so much. Okay, so I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but now we're going on to chapter three, which is recovery. I was in the hospital in Madrid for three weeks. They wanted me to stay, I think, six weeks to do the full recovery and start the physical therapy process there. But my parents were there like visiting me at the hospital staying with me for three weeks so they were eager to get back to their life and work and everything so they thought it was going to be a lot better for me to go back with them in the states for some weeks to start the recovery there and we thought like i just had mentioned that the service and the help was going to be much better in the states was not the case um the physical therapy part was good i was doing physical therapy maybe two or three times a week um, I had a lot still wrong and I needed to, to work on. I also lost a lot of nerve damage in both of my shoulders. So it was really difficult for me to raise my arm, for example, which made me really worried about tennis, which is my biggest passion. I've been playing since I'm nine years old. And that's what I was most worried about was that I wasn't going to be able to either pick up a racket, like move because I still had a broken hip. You know what's also really sad is that right before the accident I was on this really good workout plan. I was going to the gym like four or five days a week. I was doing a ton of weightlifting and I was in the best physical shape 
when it came to body mass that I had ever been in. Um, I'll, I'll put up a picture to show you kind of the before and after because it's, it's not pretty. It's night and day. It's so different. And this is only within a span of three weeks. I lost about 15 kilos, 35 to 40 pounds. But then it only took me one accident to lose everything. And since I was bedridden in the hospital, it's like I could not exercise, I couldn't do anything. So all the, the muscles are just going away because they're not getting any use. But it wasn't just physical recovery, but it was also mental recovery. The thing that was quite astonishing that the do all the doctors had said that it's kind of a miracle what had happened to me and how I was able to so quickly get back to normal, um, in their eyes at least, like mentally above all else because I had brain trauma and they weren't sure if I was going to be able to, to know anything, like to remember anything, like, oh gosh. It's all coming, like flooding back to me. I remember that they had kind of warned my mom before, like I had woken up and they said like, look, we don't know how your son is is going to be, we don't know what he's going to remember. They were telling her in advance, like, we don't know the condition of your son and just be prepared for anything. And she, I remember, oh, sorry. Like on my, my birthday is when I woke up January 5th and my mom is above the bed and she looks at me and she says like, Jordy, like, where are you? And I had this like reflex of like, what? I'm in Madrid, like, what? And then she asked like, who am I and stuff? And like, just the fact that, I mean, I felt so, I felt normal. Like I wake up and I'm like, what the hell is going on? I could see the pain in my mom's eyes. And the way that she was talking to me was like I was a child and like from her side, it's like she was so scared and I felt, always myself and I didn't feel like I had just gone through this traumatic experience like I, I didn't know what day it was which I guess is would be pretty normal if you've been out cold for five days it's like of course you don't know what day it is but um, yeah I was I was answering all of her questions and everything but of course I'm also highly medicated um, I was on these painkillers and everything so I was dozing in and out of sleep but I was so grateful to see my mom but when she talks about this time it always brings me to tears because I feel about the hardships that I cause to my parents and the fear that they had that they had lost their son because you never know in these life or death situations like you you don't know how or if your loved one is going to survive or not and mom and dad I'm so sorry to have put you through this I love you and I promise that I'm doing my best to to be responsible and for this sort of thing never to happen again I'm skipping ahead a little bit to um, to chapter 4 which is the awakening and that's everything that I've learned from this horrific experience. And that is that life is precious and being responsible is so important. And like back in the day before this accident, like I would have things like FOMO if it's a Friday night and I'm not doing anything. I'm not going out, I'm not seeing friends, I'm not going to a party. Saturday night, same thing, like, I had this fear of missing out, which I don't know why I had this, like, oh, like, it could be a great night and everything, but do you remember these nights? But every Friday night is not one of these, like, memorable nights, and going out to a club or party, I might still do that sometime, not in 2020, because that just won't happen, but I'm much less of a going out type person, which 
Everyone who knew me before the accident will tell you that I was one of the biggest partier guys. Like I'm always down for a party. And since then, it's like I have really calmed down, which is for the better mentally and physically because I'm going to bed. Like this Friday night, I went to bed at 9 p.m. <laughs> like what? And I'm getting up at 5 a.m. to to work on some projects, to, to, to clean my place, like to do a lot of productive things. And so productivity, that's another great thing. I've been way more productive since the accident than I ever was pre-accident. I'm also saving a lot of money because it's expensive to go out and party so regularly and to go and spend money on things that have no nutritional value for you. It's just a waste. I thought it would be a very important topic to, to talk about, kind of explain what had happened. I had preluded to that in previous videos and uh, so I'm happy to kind of share this really traumatic experience that happened with me just so you could get to know me a little bit better and uh, I hope that in some way this has inspired you to maybe double think some of the actions or life choices that maybe you struggle with or having FOMO. In some way, like I, I look I look at this event as actually an awakening and a very positive experience because I'm glad actually that I don't know what had happened to me because I don't have any sort of resentment towards anyone or anything. It's like Okay, a stupid night, don't know what happened, don't care. Like, I am turning the page and moving forward in a positive light. I'm bettering myself, I am healthier, I am stronger, I am more stable in life, and so much positivity has come from that experience. I've also learned how loving people are. Like, there were so many people that I hadn't talked to for years that wrote me on Facebook saying, I'm so sorry to hear what had happened, like I'm wishing you the best and well, and never felt so much love in my whole life since just after the accident, and I feel so thankful. I really hope that that helps you as well to look at the positive things in life. Always take a negative situation and turn it into a positive one. The glass is always half full. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. A la prochaine, ciao ciao for now.